Hi everybody, so I'm very honored to be here in front of so many people, so thanks Roberto for this and for the introduction. Um, in the pure tradition of Murphy's Law, uh, the only time in the year when I have to talk in front of so many people is the time where I have a severe tonsillitis. Uh, <laughs> hence the number of bottles of water here that will hopefully help me go through this. Okay, so let's start. 15 years into running a game studio, what have I learned? In fact, I have learned many things, more things probably than I could say uh, in an hour, but I'll, I, I just made a selection, uh, so let's go. So uh, first I'll make a brief introduction before getting into uh, my points. Uh, so at first, uh, in 1996, which is about uh, 22 years ago, I started uh, as a programmer in Ubisoft in Paris. Um, so I called myself a dinosaur here. Um, the first project on which I worked, you could see this car racing game called Pod on PC first. And uh, as you can see from the screenshot, uh, it was not quite there in terms of um, graphic quality, HUD quality, etc. But that's what Ubisoft was doing at the time. Uh, the game was named Pod because the um, three programmers who started on it were Philippe, Olivier and Daniel. So that, that, that was the reason. Um, eventually, they had to come up with something after the fact, so they uh, dubbed it Planet of Death. Um, and, for, and for the anecdote, uh, Lucas Arts was working on a game no, named Pod Racing that they had to rename Star Wars Episode I Racing because Ubisoft was first with a similar name on the racing game. Um, yeah, after that, Ubisoft uh, did a number of other racing games since we had the engine, like this Formula One uh, racing uh, simulation game there, uh, on which I also worked. Um, then eventually they dropped the genre. Um, so I, I was really a programmer at Ubisoft and I wanted to fulfill the dream of uh, becoming an entrepreneur. I did not see myself uh, spending my whole uh, career as a programmer. So eventually, in 2003, after seven years, or almost eight, um, I came to Bangkok where I started Sanuk Games, uh, first as an outsourcing uh, company because I didn't really have a specific idea of what could I make that would make business sense, except from uh, Ubisoft is already opening shops in many countries where the cost is cheaper than uh, in France, so uh, why shouldn't I do the same thing and try to sell services? Um, so, well, I'll get uh, into further details in, uh, of what the company made, but essentially uh, we developed a number of casual and uh, arcade games on all of the systems, a bit on mobile, but uh, mostly on PC and consoles. Uh, as you can see here, yeah, the, there's a Bomberman-like, uh, there is a um, card game solitaire, there is a Breakout-like, there is a Tetris-like, uh, and a Mahjong. Uh, Mahjong Solitaire, actually. Uh, so, yeah, these are some of the many games we made. Uh, and recently we uh, stepped up and we worked during the past two years on a uh, fishing simulation game for PC and PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, which is a full 3D open world game. Um, so, uh, yeah, this was really a uh, tough project for us because, because it was a big, a big step from uh, everything else we had been doing prior to that. So the first question is, why would you even uh, consider starting a game studio on, our, on your own? Um, as per the Maslow Pyramid, um, you first have to manage with survival before you can consider um, safety in the longer term. And once safety is, a she is achieved, then eventually you can focus on self-realization. Like what would you like to do for yourself uh, and to achieve by yourself? The thing is that many of the reasons why you would start a game studio in the first place uh, relate to self-realization. Like, hey, I have a game idea, I want to see it come to life. Or, I want to prove myself I can do this. Uh, or, I want to be somebody. Or, yeah, if it works out, I'm going to make a lot of money. But that's if it works out. Uh, the thing is that most of the studios aren't successful. It's really a bet against the odds. And in uh, many cases, you will deal more with day-to-day -day survival than with actual self-realization. Which is my first point. Be sure you st start a business for the right reasons. Um, I would say that uh, if you find self-realization in managing to survive, then you're good. Um, 
but uh, yeah, if you if your idea is that you won't be satisfied uh, until you get rich or famous or somebody, um, maybe uh, it's a self-defeating endeavor. I mean, some succeed, but uh, looks at, look at the statistics. So what we did at first, because I didn't really have an idea of uh, what to sell, uh, I first I managed to have Ubisoft, my former employer, to outsource to me uh, some small projects, and then I um, basically tried to um, ping all of my uh, professional network uh, for and search for anybody who would outsource anything to us, and we did a lot of different things here. Uh, you, find, you can find screenshots, screenshots of, uh, respectively, a 2D bitmap animation uh, editor. Well, at that time, there wasn't like a Unity, Unreal, and whatnot, so really, uh, m many of the companies had to build their own editing tools. Um, then you can see a Bezier Curve editor, which we did for another company. Then you can see some QA, which we did. Uh, you can see a Flash game on the brand of Star Wars Episode 3, which we did as well. Um, you can see a Game Boy Advance game. I guess we did a few of those, not as full development, but more as a localization and producing of new SKUs, like from Japanese to English, for example. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of things we made. Uh, the thing is that uh, it didn't work too well uh, because we were caught in a um, basically in a losing cycle. Cycle. We were not specialized, um, so people did not really identify us as as people who can do the 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 specific need thing that they need very well. So the business opportunities were rare. And uh, when we got one, it was for the only reason that we were cheap. So basically, we were not really able to charge decent premiums. We had a low income, so we were not really able to offer competitive salaries. Um, and therefore, the staff wasn't motivated because of that. Also, because of the rare business opportunities and the inability to choose, uh, as you can see from uh, the previous screen, all of the um, how to say all of the um, uh, all of the new projects were different from the previous ones, uh, and uh, therefore we had to face the learning curve every time. And uh, the team didn't have sense of achievement or career vision, which again again worked against staff motivation. We had a high staff turnover, and the high staff turnover is in turn a reason for the lack of specialization. So in short, it wasn't working well. Um, so you need to specialize. Um, I did survive without specialization at first because of the extremely lucky conditions that I had. Uh, I started in 2003. There, there had been a huge Asian crisis in 1997, and therefore the difference of cost between Southeast Asia and Europe was uh, absolutely huge at the time. And it re really didn't, uh, in Thailand, it really didn't cost much to start a business and hire people as compared to um, the cost of operation in Europe. So because of that, I survived. But if I was to start the same business today, no way. Um, so you must really identify a skill set that you uh, can develop and that the market needs. So what we did at some point, it was the uh, beginning of the mobile phone uh, game craze. So I thought like, yeah, let's try and jump onto that. We might find some uh, sustainable business there. In fact, we didn't match. Um, because that market wasn't really ma mature. It wasn't really ready. Uh, at the time, uh, uh, there, was ga there were games based on uh, Java interpretation uh, that were running on devices. The thing is that the, the Java interpretation was varying a lot from device to device. So literally, you, have, you had to make a build for every single device. Uh, and also, uh, there was no single store like the Apple App Store or Google Play. It was all managed by the carriers who had their specific experience. So at the time, the publishers ended up like uh, literally making 3,000 builds for one game, if you count all of the different devices and all of the different carriers and languages, and it was unmanageable. Uh, nobody really uh, got rich from that. So the, that market didn't last long. Uh, our clients were not too successful, so we were not too successful either. And we bought uh, this huge amount of devices. Uh, most of them were used like only once or maybe twice. Um, these are projects we did. Uh, one was called Dead Floor. It was like a rhythm game for a company called Dead. I don't even know if they still exist. Uh, the second one was uh, After Dark Flying Toaster. Uh, the brand uh, initially was a screensaver on PC, I believe. 
and um, it belonged to Vivendi, and Vivendi wanted to make a, bu a one-button game out of it, and uh, yeah, it didn't work. It could have at a different time and on different devices. It could have been a Flappy Bird, I guess, but it just didn't happen to be. Um, so yeah, this was what uh, what I would call a bubble. Uh, it burst. So yeah. When you jump on a new trend uh, that can bring you outsourcing deals, you, you must really be able to foresee, to evaluate if it's worth investing to develop a specialization on something or is, if that something will bust out too quick uh, in order to make sense. Well, everything eventually dies someday, but uh, you must be sure that the market lasts long enough uh, to be worthy. Um, as a side question, would I invest today in blockchain related business? My own answer is no, but I may be wrong. Um, time will tell. So eventually, we found luck with Nintendo. Uh, we were lucky to be licensed uh, by Nintendo on, the, on their systems. What happened is that I also thought we could try to make console games. So I asked Sony and I asked Nintendo. But Sony at the time was the market leader. Um, and uh, they would not even consider us as a small studio who was just starting. They said no. Plus, they wouldn't even consider Southeast Asia at the time. Um, and Nintendo, on the contrary, was given for dead. Uh, because the GameCube, ha GameCube sorry, had underperformed uh, and nobody would believe that the Nintendo DS would have any significant success. So yeah, I asked for the Nintendo DS license and they said, yes, sure, here you go. It turned out that the DS was the successful system of its generation. And as soon as it really started working, many studios wanted in, but then Nintendo closed the gates. Uh, so we were in at the right time. Um, so we, be we become specialists of developing, turn de developing like full games uh, with low budget on Nintendo systems. Uh, we did a number of games on Nintendo DS and on Wii um, as a contractor to multiple publishers like Big Ben, like Avanquest, like Mindscape, like Eidos. And during 2.5 years, we were uh, really able to make money, to make profits. Uh, I ended up like uh, at the end of, uh, I mean, at the peak of that era uh, with something like uh, three to four hundred thousand dollars in the bank account. I wish I had cashed out at the time. Uh, but um, yeah, these were our best years. But eventually, it didn't last. Then came the iPhone and uh, uh, the games that used to cost like $30 a pop for the general public uh, came to $1 a pop. Uh, so that was the end of it. So yeah, that's the thing. You know that things never last forever in our industry trends change, uh, so you must really uh, keep in touch with market evolution and know when to stop uh, investing into uh, specializing yourself into a trend. So you have to pivot, and pivot, pivoting is uncomfortable, it is risky, but uh, not pivoting um, is basically a guarantee of failure uh, if, you, if you need to pivot and you don't. Uh, pivot in a business means like you change uh, basically the focus of your, of your business from doing one thing to do, to do totally to doing totally another thing. It's something that in technology you have to do when you realize that the thing you are doing just doesn't have a market anymore. Okay, uh, one good thing about pivoting is that well, our successful clients did pivot as well. Um, well, some of our clients were not so successful, like Mindscape. They were gone after the bubble of uh, Nintendo burst. Uh, but Avanquest and Big Ben, they were still around. Avanquest left the game industry and became specialists in uh, like image processing software and solution, like uh, the uh, FreePrints mobile app, the photo in picture photo clip um, uh, editor on PC. Uh, Big Ben went to bigger projects, like the fishing simulation game we did. And uh, because um, we had initiate good, initiated good relationship with them, uh, they could embark us on that. Uh, we, we did occasional work on Avanquest's photo editing software, and of course Big Ben came uh, to us for the fishing simulation game. Uh, so that's the thing. Um, if you can identify which clients uh, are good, really invest in them to make them happy. Um, I would say a good client is a client, of course, who's fair with their contractors, but also who has an ability on their own to anticipate market trends and to adapt and to survive. 
because uh, then they will be around for long. And um, if they have good relationship with you, even when they pivot, they might still want to embark you on their new journey uh, because they could look for another contractor who is specialist of what they uh, start doing. But uh, hiring a new contractor and starting a new relationship is also a risk. If they trust you and they have confidence that you are interested in following them in what they're doing, they might keep working with you. Um, so this brings me to the point of how do you maintain client trust? Uh, so obviously the, the obvious answer to that is you deliver uh, on time, on budget, with the quality uh, expected, etc. Uh, but obviously it doesn't always happen like that. Uh, I wish it would. Um, so when the project has problems, uh, it may help, in fact, uh, in my view at least, uh, to have a, an open book with the client, like you share with them everything that they want to know. You don't hide things from them, like who's working on what project. So it might uh, help to host everything online and uh, open them permanently, their, uh, your repositories of source code on their project, uh, the online storage of all of the assets and documents, uh, the project ma management boards, like here on Trello. Uh, we did that on the phishing simulation game. Uh, I would say the thing is, don't expect them to look at that regularly. They have other things to do, really. Um, but at least it's there, and uh, it gives them the confidence uh, that um, you're not hiding things. Um, it's, um, it's more like it will not. Uh, it will not save you from the need of uh, communicating with them adequately on what they have to know, uh, but it may help build trust. Um, so, uh, yeah, make regular deliveries and have conference calls with them in order to, um, uh, in order to uh, be sure that they look at the delivery and that they give you feedback and etc. and be proactive in communicating with them. Um, that's what we did as well. The problem with that is that with, when your client is a middle or big size corporation, uh, you won't get the C-level or the key decision makers to attend those things on a regular basis. Again, they have other things to do. Um, so uh, they, you would have some junior producer on the other side uh, who will uh, take note of uh, what you tell them and uh, they will eventually have a meeting with their boss and tell their boss. And the thing is, in my experience, that is not enough. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, each time a relationship with a client went sour, it's really when I lost touch with the sea level, when I lost touch with the people I really had to talk to and gain the trust of. Uh, and I would say those persons are hard to catch. They are not available on the phone every time you need. They will not uh, uh, attend your weekly meetings, etc. But you have to do whatever it takes uh, to to maintain the contact with them, even if that involves traveling to trade shows where they attend or traveling to their office from time to time. And when your clients are in Europe and you are in Asia, it is some effort, uh, but I think that is necessary from my experience. Speaking of going to trade shows, um, Going to trade shows is super expensive. Uh, really, you have to pay for the plane ticket, for the accommodation, for the um, booth if you have a booth, or for the entry ticket uh, if you're just a visitor. But even the entry ticket in GDC is like $2,000. Um, so uh, if you are an indie studio who publishes their games by themselves, it is something you can skip entirely uh, because you can do many things online. Uh, and it's not obvious that uh, going to trade shows would bring you as much value as it costs you. But if you are in the work for hire business and looking for clients, uh, you have to go there. Indeed, to look for clients, to build your network, and also, as I just mentioned before, to be sure to keep the contacts with the key people among your existing clients. Uh, so there's many trade shows. I listed a few of them here. Uh, there's a picture here of uh, Roberto that was taken three years ago at GDC. Um, and obviously you don't want to go to all trade shows. Actually, if you list all trade shows, I think there's not one week in the year where there isn't uh, anything happening anywhere. So you, you could pretty much spend your life on trade shows if you had the time and the money, uh, but it makes no sense. You really have to select, in my view, the uh, three, four trade shows in a year that really makes make most sense to you and focus on those one and prepare your attendance adequately in order to have things to show and to make a good impression. 
the point that I wanted to make related to that is that when you do business to business, when you are an outsourcing shop, really uh, business development and business management is a full-time job. Uh, and that's why an outsourcing studio has to have a certain size because there are all the people who actually produce things for the clients. Uh, and uh, there's also one person, it's probably going to be you if, there, if you're the entrepreneur, who must work on business development and business management. Uh, and it's really a key component and a key cost uh, in your business and uh, yeah I, I have had when I had tensions with some clients I have had clients who told me hey you spend too much time on trade show uh, I, and yeah I know how much these the things cost and uh, you know when I pay you uh, I'm not paying you for that I want you to to be working on the project and to deliver and that's what I'm paying you for and uh, I answer them seriously I mean uh, if you give me a guarantee uh, if you buy my company if you give me a guarantee that you will keep uh, keep us working for years to come Maybe I can stop going on trade shows, but uh, since the commitment I have from you is like six months of work or something, what do I do after that? I have to take care of myself. And uh, that's something you have to pay for in exchange for the uh, fact of hiring me for a limited period of time. So uh, I'm going to back to the um, uh, indie development and publishing. It was in 2009 after the Nintendo bubble burst. Um, we uh, were in fact uh, left with no orders in the pipeline. That's the default of uh, branding yourself as a specialist of something like Nintendo DS and Wii games. Uh, and then that thing disappears and then uh, you have to rebrand yourself and it doesn't happen overnight in people's mind that they could hire you from so for something else. So the thing is that uh, we were left with no order, but as I mentioned before, with significant cash. So I was like, okay, why not try and uh, fund our own games? and uh, publish them on the stores and see how it goes. Uh, so we tried on the stores at the time. That was also the time that the digital stores started opening on, the, on consoles. And that's important to mention. I didn't have that idea when I first started the business in 2003, because back then that possibility didn't exist. The only business you could have as a game studio is to sign with a publisher. You could not publish your own stuff. Uh, but uh, in 2009, it started being the case with WiiWare, DSiWare, the PlayStation Store, then the iPhone. Um, so we we released games. I had the idea of developing games on our own and also of licensing games from other studios that they had developed on some platforms uh, in order to port them to other platforms. And at the time that made sense because again there was no unity. Uh, all of the games were developed uh, directly on the I API of, of the systems and it was a real amount of work to port a game from a platform to another and uh, most of the small studios wouldn't uh, do that. So here are some of the games that we published at the time. Uh, yeah, there, there was a crossword game, there was a horror game based on small video clips called History Project. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, there was, there was Twin Blades there, which was a hack and slash. There was a hidden object game called Actual Crimes Jack the Ripper. There was a rhythm game called Drums Challenge. Uh, what else? Yeah, Pix and Love Rush was a retro styled uh, platformer. Um, yeah, there, 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 there were a bunch of games like that. So yeah, I have a, co a couple of comments to make about that. Um, the first comment is uh, you have to be there at the right time. Basically, uh, when we start on PlayStation Mini, when we started on PlayStation Minis, so PlayStation Minis were the low-priced games at the time that were running on PSP and PlayStation Three. Um, and uh, we started when it opened because as much as Sony had refused us uh, earlier on uh, when they opened the PlayStation Store, they were looking for small studios and they came back to us and they were like, hey, do you want the dev kit for free? So I said yes, obviously, and we started on that. The first thing we did was a simple and pretty stupid Spot the Differences game. It was not even a very good game on PSP because you don't have a touch screen, so you have to use the controls in order to uh, point the area of the screen that you want to identify as a difference. Uh, but eventually, this was our bestseller just because it was uh, the first thing that we released when they opened this, the service there were not too many games and it has a it had a good initial peak and a very long uh, tail uh, so really on consoles I would say it really matters to be there at the right time um, if you release a game on the console when there's already uh, hundreds or thousands of games as is the case now on all of the current consoles including the switch there's over a thousand games now on switch uh, you don't uh, have as much of a chance to succeed. 
So you have to be on the right systems with the right games. Uh, our Crossword and Sudoku games uh, were successful on Nintendo DS. They were not successful on PSP, even though they had good reviews. Um, again, because the PlayStation brand targets an audience of mostly males, mostly age 13 years old to 30 years old. Uh, and that's not the people who play Crosswords or Sudoku. Um, so, um, yeah. So you, you, you really have to, uh, I mean, well, these are examples that are uh, from uh, back in the days, but more recently also, when we developed for Big Ben, for Big ben uh, Breakout-like and the Tetris-like, those games were working correctly. I mean, the selling sold reasonably well on consoles, but they, don't, didn't sell at, they didn't sell at all on Steam, because again, nobody goes on Steam to buy a Tetris. Yeah, niches as well. Uh, we released that game uh, called, called Jumps Challenge, which was originally developed by a Brazilian studio. We licensed it from them. Uh, originally, it was on iPhone, and we ported it on PSP. Uh, the game was very good, in my opinion. It was the first uh, rhythm-based game that I saw that consisted in actually playing some music, like playing the right drums and the right, with the right drum sound. Uh, I liked it. We released it. It really performed poorly, probably because you have to like the idea of playing drums while also having a PSP or a PS3 uh, with, the, uh, with the account to buy online, which at the time was not so common. So the intersection of this wasn't there. Uh, so um, niches are nice, but sometimes a niche is just too small to make sense. So I guess I could go on and on with this. Unfortunately, I wouldn't have the time. But the general idea is that um, it's very much important to make executive decisions uh, in publishing that makes sense. Uh, with thorough knowledge of the market and what your chances are. Um, you can't just say, hey, I have a game idea, I want this game to come to life, and that's it. Uh, that's not how you can be successful in this business. Um, so again, uh, that's why, in the same way that when you are an outsourcing shop, you must dedicate, you have pretty much a dedicated person for business management and development. When you are an indie studio that self-publishes, I think it's also a dedicated full-time job uh, to keep in touch with the market and make the right executive decisions and also, um, how to say, uh, execute all of the communication and PR on your game. So you cannot just be focused on product development when so much depends on market factors. Um, it takes a good product to succeed, but it takes more than that, actually. It also takes a uh, right fit between the product and the market, uh, bringing the, the product at the right time on the right platforms, uh, and um, executing a PR campaign uh, well enough. My experience of using brand licenses uh, yeah, we licensed uh, newspaper brands, The Telegraph in the UK and Die Welt in Germany, uh, to make the Crossword and Sudoku games. Uh, we did not license any brand in France because all of the brands I talked to declined. Um, and eventually, the French version was by far the most successful. Um, and when I think about it in retrospect, it makes sense because this was a bad idea. I, a newspaper brand, I mean, my idea at first was that, yeah, people will, 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 think, will think it's just shitty crosswords if they come from nowhere, but if, if it's telegraph crosswords, then they have a guarantee of quality. But in fact, I mean, that may have played a role, but uh, more importantly than that, newspaper brands are not federative. Uh, news, newspaper brands are divisive. A newspaper uh, targets a specific niche of uh, uh, society, uh, depending on political opinions, depending on circles, educations, etc. And uh, I cannot think of one newspaper uh, that is liked by a majority of persons. Even if you go to UK and you take The Sun, which is the newspaper with by far the highest circulations, circulation, it is also the newspaper that is most hated. Um, Sometimes for good reasons. Uh, but but um, yeah, so basically, licensing a brand doesn't always make sense. You have to be sure that you're, when you license a brand, it will uh, not cut you from your potential public, but actually bring potential public to you. On the other hand, more recently, we made a Bomberman, a Bomberman clone on PC and consoles called Bombing Bastards at first, although we had to rename, renaming Bombing Busters in some of the systems uh, because, yeah. Uh, Nintendo and Steam were okay with bastards, but Sony and Microsoft were not. Um, 
So um, anyway, yeah, our idea at the time was to uh, make a Bomberman clone because there was no Bomberman. There hadn't been a Bomberman for five, six years. There, there wasn't a Bomberman on on uh, present generation systems at the time. Uh, so I felt I felt like, hey, the people are longing for that, and that's a, a gap to fill. But why, what I didn't realize is that in this case, on the contrary, people were not longing, longing for the gameplay itself as much as they were longing for the brand. And the idea of the clone, uh, the idea of a clone was unappealing to many. They wanted the real thing, and the game did not perform as much as I would have wanted because of that. So yeah, you really have to have some clue about what uh, makes sense as brand licensing, uh, if you go that way. And also, licensing brands is is, all, is a business development work in itself. You have to approach the uh, brand owners and uh, talk with them about the conditions. Uh, not all of them will understand the business that you're into or will have reasonable expectations. Uh, so you have to see. You really have to find the right brand for the right product uh, that will appeal, appeal to the right audience without cutting away some of that audience and uh, you have to make sure that uh, the licensors have a proper understanding of your business and realistic expectations uh, about what you can do with the brand and also are uh, decently easy people to work with because they will have a right to say on everything you do and if they block everything they can make your production a hell. Another point I wanted to make, uh, store appearance is really super important and uh, needs premium care, uh, needs a lot of care from you. You have to um, work on the icon of your game. You have to, to work even on the title of your game. When you see games from big publishers, I don't know, like uh, uh, Assassin's Creed or whatnot, they don't have descriptive names because they don't need them. There's so much communication on each and every of these big games that basically when you when you hear the title you know what it is you have heard about it somewhere but on the games you will make basically you are targeting people who will never have heard of it and whose only contact whose first contact with the title will be on the store and the title must appeal to that to, to them and the only way to achieve that is that basically when they read the title of your game they have an idea of what it is this is super important a crossword game must in, must include crosswords. A racing game must include racing uh, in the title. Um, and also, when you look at the list of icons on an app store, make sure that your icon stands out. You must make tests. You must come with different uh, propositions and see how they how how, how they fare. Um, this is important because basically you're spending so much effort in terms of man months in developing the product that it would be really a shame uh, to um, fail on uh, the product visibility when it's less effort but it's more, uh, uh, but it's more important to do. Uh, I would say also, I mean, yeah, this is not up to date. I should also have talked about the trailer. Nowadays, it's really important to have a good trailer, and uh, you want to uh, assign a significant amount of resource into that. So that's it, yeah. So be sure to give store appearance the effort it deserves. Uh, because basically, yeah, the thing is, most of, peop most of the people will get to know your game from the store. They will not get, get to know your game from third-party websites or, or YouTube videos or whatnot. Some will, but that will not be the majority. They will get to know your game from the store, and they must be intrigued uh, from what they see at first in the store. Of course, then they may want to check the reviews and videos in order to confirm whether they are going to like it or not. Uh, but first, they, uh, but uh, if the game is unappealing to them at first in the store, they will not even go that far. The other points I was willing to make uh, was um, re related to were related to our fishing simulation game, which we did for Big Ben. Uh, we've been working on it for two years, and two years ago, what had happened is that because of, of all that I explained in indie game publishing, I felt like it was not a viable business for us anymore, and I was ready two years ago to shut down the company. Um, because I feel like nowadays there are so many indie games, so many platforms, so so many 
uh, I mean, so many indie games on each platform uh, that uh, it's really a, be a bet against the odds to release an indie game, and it can be something you do if you don't have a huge fixed cost because you're working from home and uh, etc but you're working from home and etc but when you are a studio like us with an office to pay every month and salaries to pay every month for uh, 15 17 persons uh, such a bet against the odd was not sustainable in the long term so i was willing to shut down when i when eventually uh, big ben came to us and say said hey we we are moving to higher end games because that market space is less crowded uh, and we want to uh, have you guys make a higher end game for us and i was like yeah sure so i hesitated still at first because um that was the fishing simulation game. It was something that was really so much more complex uh, than what we had done before. We didn't have uh, any of the skills in 3D modeling, in animation, in game design for this game genre, uh, etc. So should we even pitch? I mean, we were, we, we were not even able to, to, to make a budget because we were not really uh, able to foresee uh, the workload that that would be. Uh, so we let the client basically tell us how much they think it would cost, and we, we, we pitched on that. Um, so I hesitated, but really when the choice is between this and closing the company, what do you have to lose? So where did it go? The product is finished now. Uh, we assembled the team, which was at most like 27 people plus contractors. Uh, we set up a tour of production process and we really learned a lot. Now we are ready to tackle another uh, project of the same level of complexity, double A, I would say. Uh, the problems being that, uh, well, uh, the production took two years instead of a year and a half, uh, so it was very much over the estimate. Uh, we had to ask for 25% more budget, otherwise we wouldn't have made it. And even then, I wish we had even more budget because we could have polished the game so much better if we had like three, three four more months, but we just didn't have that. Uh, and the game had to be significantly, significantly reduced in scope. Um, the um, we we went down from 15 scenes to nine scenes and we cut the multiplayer mode uh, and even though we did all of that we end up with no profit not much money a big and hungry team to keep feeding and we have yet to find our next opportunity so we're not in a uh, very good situation right now but i'm trying so yeah, you have to plan for a tough right when you pivot and you endeavor something that is really um, this much more complex than anything you've, you're, you've done before. And I, I would say, uh, yeah, you must be upfront with the client uh, on the fact that you may have to reduce the scope, uh, that uh, you will struggle. And uh, if they know that and they still trust you, then you're okay. Of course, if you over-promise, you guarantee you will deliver something that you have no idea whether you're going to deliver, uh, you're bracing yourself for trouble. Uh, we chose Unity um, essentially because, well, for CryEngine we were wary of the fact that uh, there's not too much public do documentation available. Uh, for Unreal, we would maybe have chosen it, but they have licensing terms that our, publishers could, our publisher could not accept. They want 5% on the back end of the game revenue, and unless you murder the CEO of our publisher, I don't know how you get, you're going to get that signed. Um, so eventually Unity was the only choice left. Um, the good point with Unity is that at some point the, um, they helped us, uh, they got involved, they even sent somebody to our office for free in order to provide training and study our project. Uh, of course they did it only once and then uh, if we had needed more they would charge. Um, but it was still very helpful. Uh, we are very thankful to them for that. Also, we used a number of plugins written by third-party developers. And the, go the good thing with the, those plugins is that it's really easy to get in touch with the developers and tell them, hey, your plugin doesn't do this, doesn't do that. It doesn't work on consoles, it's only on PC. How about I help you uh, make it run and etc. cetera. Um, I, I help you basically improve its functionality and make it run on console. And uh, that's a selling point for you uh, to sell it to further developers and that's useful for me for my project and uh, most of the plugin developers are uh, open to that. So what we, did, what we did is that we pulled resources with another studio in Bangkok called Ring Zero Game Studio. Uh, it was the quickest way to have a team that is big enough to tackle the project uh, rather than grow organically. Um, so uh, the thing is that 
uh, thank goodness there was goodwill on both sides. Um, there was no, no like a uh, high level uh, dispute, uh, but still it had a lot of challenges. Uh, the um, process, the the process uh, and the management culture was very much complexified because of this. Uh, there were many clashes between teams because they didn't work to, together well. I can tell that uh, during the past couple of months, I have heard cursing uh, about the other team pretty much every day in my team. Um, and uh, really, the, it requires a high level of mutual trust between studios. And even then, that mutual trust is put to a test. So it's something that, uh, I mean, I would do again, but uh, with prob prob probably a better definition of who does what and what the process is. Uh, it was really a challenge for us. So what we did as well, we, we, outsourced, we, we outsourced part of the work to other studios. Uh, Teapot studio, studio for some art, uh, Imba for the sound. That went well with both of them. So uh, that's something I would encourage people to do uh, when you have a large number of assets to produce, you really need to find people who can help you do that. Um, the, it works well with assets, with art and sound. It's more difficult to make it work with programming, though. And uh, in order to do that successfully, you, you, you need to have a good process of communicating with the contractors. Um, and you need to have a project that is advanced enough so that there, there is a clear vision of what needs to be done. Uh, and we hired people, but again, uh, when you hire many people in a short amount of time, um, you have hits and misses, uh, problems with skills, uh, when you had uh, identified them wrongly, problems with um, people who don't fit in the team, uh, who create friction, people who resign because uh, they took your job, but finally they immediately have a better opportunity. Uh, so. Uh, not all hires will work, but all, I, all hires will cost you. Uh, and time will be wasted, resources will be wasted, and uh, that is something you need to account for, basically. The time and the cost and the risks of assembling a team uh, must be taken into consideration when making the budget. Okay, uh, the other point is how do you not dis discourage people? Because to reach the target quality of on something you have never done, um, you will need many iteration in a number of areas uh, uh, from the, how to say, um, the modeling, the texturing, the animation, the motion capture, uh, the scene composition, the rendering, the optimization, etc., etc. And uh, all of that must come through iterations. As you can see in an earlier build of our game, uh, the 3D scene didn't look that, that good and it took multiple months to uh, get to the second picture which is the final visual quality mm -hmm. of our game um, and um, you must do all of this while building the team and be, being under pressure from the client to deliver and it's very tough uh, and people can lose heart when it's too tough uh, that's the thing. The job is experimental in nature so you must have a co company culture it, in which it is okay to fail uh, the KPI is not did you succeed, but did you try hard enough? Uh, and you must understand people when they cannot do uh, on, the, uh, on the first step uh, the thing that you want done. You must account for their need to learn and to go iteratively. You must have enough confidence in your team to know that if they try hard enough, sooner or later, they will get there. And that's what happened, unfortunately, later rather than sooner. Um, and that's the thing, you, you have to be okay with failures, but your client will not. Your client has its own uh, pressure from uh, retailers, etc. Uh, so they will pass pressure onto you. And sometimes in blunt terms, I must say that I had some arguments with Big Ben on the project at some point. Um, and what you are tempted to do is to transfer that pressure onto the team. Like, what the heck is this? It's not going well, change this, we must reach this in the next sprint. And if you do that too much, that's why your team lose, loses hearts. The problem is that your employees don't have as much stake as, as you do in the project. And if it goes wrong, it's easy for them to resign and find another job. Uh, but you have invest, invested your business, your company into getting this done uh, and your trust with the client. So you have higher stakes. And as a result, you must absorb some of the pressure and manage uh, re relationships with your staff more tightly.
So that's the thing. Uh, do you tell everything to your, to your staff as bluntly as the client tells it to you? Uh, probably not. Uh, you have to absorb the pressure. The same way as you absorb the pressure from your staff when you talk to the client. If your staff tells you, hey, the client is nuts, they don't understand anything in what they're asking, you don't repeat that to the client. It happened to me uh, once in a while that some staff forget to remove the client from CC when they say that, uh, but eventually uh, that's not good. So, um, yeah, you, you have to basically uh, be a filter of what information gets to one side and to the other. Of course, there's a limit to that. You cannot just tell bull bullshit to one side and bullshit to the other, uh, because eventually they will find out and uh, you lose credibility both towards your staff and towards your clients. So there's a narrow path to find. Yeah, my last point, I think, um, would be um, it's easy to, ma to be overwhelmed with the complexity of a larger project, uh, with the process, uh, with the structure, with everything you have to take care of. And this can be to the detriment of the vision of the product. It's easy to, how do you say, uh, make a design decision without having looked at how the competition is. Uh, it's easy to be caught in details that really bug you and forget the vision of the larger picture. Um, and simply, sometimes, uh, many people have specific tasks in working on such and such part, but some of the parts are overlooked because it's nobody's job. Um, and I think uh, you must set up a company culture in which um, people play the game, even if it's crappy, even if it's not enjoyable to play, and they play competing games as well on a regular basis. Maybe you have to allocate some time for that, uh, some sessions to do that, in order to keep in touch uh, what your game is versus what the competition is and where you need to get. Um, and uh, there's no time in the project development that is too soon to do that. I guess that's it. Thank you.